Hello, I'm Mrs Barry and welcome to the tutorial on the poem Remains by Simon Armitage. This poem features in the Power and Conflict Poetry Cluster and if you have got your copy of your anthology with you, it'd be a great idea to have it open at the page featuring this particular poem. Whenever we look at a text, it's always worth considering what was the inspiration. Simon Armitage wrote a collection of poems that all feature in this Channel 4 documentary, The Not Dead, and they're all about the different experiences people go through when faced with conflict, uh, war in particular. As you know, your cluster is called Power and Conflict, and many of the poems are based on war and personal experiences. So before we look at this particular poem by Simon Armitage, it is worth you clicking on the link, or at least typing in the link, and watching the extract from the Channel 4 documentary. In the documentary, you'll meet a soldier, not much older than you actually, called Guardsman Tromans who was the inspiration behind this particular poem. Simon Armitage interviewed each of these soldiers and sometimes their relatives, and then took all that information and turned them into these wonderful poems. Have a go at the five questions that I've put on this slide in response to what you see when you experience the extract about Guardsman Tromans. Now you've watched the extract from the Channel 4 documentary, I'd like you to click on the bbc.com bite size link there, or at least type it in, and have a watch and listen to Simon Armitage, the poet himself, performing this poem, Remains. So now you've watched the documentary, You've got an idea of the context, what influenced Simon Armitage to write this poem, and you've listened to the poet himself actually reciting this poem. It's time to get a bit technical, because don't forget, we're not just reading these poems for pleasure. We are preparing ourselves to take an examination. So here we're going to explore the writer's craft. And in your exam, you will always need to comment on the form, the structure, and the language and how the writer has used these to convey overall meaning to the reader. Now people get concerned about form, you, you don't need to, it is just as the slide suggests there. All form is is the actual form that the poem takes. So how many stanzas has the poet put in there? How many lines are in each of these stanzas? Are the line lengths regular or irregular? Um, are how many syllables are in each line? In other words, what's the beat, the meter, the rhythm of the poem? Are there any rhyming patterns? Are there some internal rhymes where more than one word has the same sound in a line of poetry? Or are there some end line rhymes where the end word, the last word in a line, rhymes with the last word in a line later on in a stanza? Genre of poetry. Sometimes Poets will actually choose to write in a specific style, like a sonnet or a ballad or a dramatic monologue, for example. Enjambment is a really key one for this particular poem. And enjambment just means when a line runs on. It's particularly poignant in this poem because Armitage decides to use enjambment not just within a stanza, but across stanzas. And that's what I want to draw your attention to, first of all. If you have a look, the first example that I'm referring to is on line eight. Can you see how three of a kind all let him fly? And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side is all one sentence. So Armitage could have easily have put those together as three lines of, poem, uh, of poetry in one stanza. 
but is deliberately here used on jarment. You could argue it's to keep with the four line stanza regular formation, but I think there's something more going on. So let's just take a look at that line eight. Three of a kind all let him fly, and I swear I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So there's a couple of breaks here, and there's a reason for those breaks. When he says, and I swear, to me, that's almost as if he is going back into his memory and reliving that particular experience. So rather than just tell the story, he's completely absorbed himself in that moment in time. And even the use of the dash after life, it's like him pausing for a minute to reflect. Um, did I really? Am I exaggerating? No, I swear I saw broad daylight on the other side. As each bullet, each round ripped into this guy's body that he and two of his colleagues, fellow soldiers, shot at. This looter. We've got another example of um a little later on. On line 20, where there's also an example of Cesura. Now, all Cesura is, is when there is a definite stop on a line of poetry. So you can see on line 20, we've got a full stop. Then I'm, on, I'm home on leave. But I blink. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank. So again, like before, why didn't he just carry that line of poetry on? There's a reason why he's chosen to break that particular stanza there, stanza five, use on jarment to carry on the line, but to start stanza six. Because again, for me, when this soldier blinks, he's going back into his memory bank and reliving that experience as if he's still there. And this, to me, reinforces that idea of doesn't matter whether he's physically in the same location as the shooting actually took place or whether he's actually left there and gone home and he's meant to be on leave, relaxing, switching off. He can't switch off from this because this is a mental situation that he's in. This is a mental scarring that can't heal as quickly as any sort of physical scarring. Structure is exactly as it says on the slide. It is just the order in which the information is presented to you. So again, don't get too fussed about this. Just look at what am I told at the beginning? What, do I, what am I then getting told towards the middle? How does the poem end? So for me, this is a chronological poem, although it is told in flashback. So the events already happened and this soldier is recalling a past event, just like he did when Simon Armitage was interviewing in the documentary for Channel 4. A volta is where there is a sudden shift, a sudden change, a twist, if you like, in the poem. It's not as obvious in this poem as it is maybe in others, but I think, for me, the shift comes on line 20, when you realise that when he's home on leave, he is suffering just as much, if not worse, in a way, than when he's actually on tour and physically in the same location as the war zone. In his mind, everywhere's a war zone. And he's in his mind, it's a war zone he can't escape from. Sad, isn't it? Language in this poem is practical, quite matter of fact in a lot of places. He's almost trying to remove himself, I think, and step back and, and almost retell this as if it wasn't really him. Look at how casually he says, well, myself and somebody else and somebody else on line five. Um, as if, you know, the other people don't matter. Um, I've even forgotten who they were. I doubt very much that he has. Or maybe he doesn't want to reveal who they are. Maybe he's protecting them in some way. Three of a kind all let him fly. You know, let him fly. He says it's quite playful. And it contrasts with what they're actually talking about they're talking about bullets that are being fired and are flying through the air towards their victim and then look at the shift in the language 
when suddenly it's ripping through his life. And that, I think, links in with the enjambment. When he goes into his memory bank and he actually starts to emotionally revisit that experience, it becomes much more real for him and much more horrific. So gone is the kind of matter of fact, almost blasé, I don't really care attitude of the language from before. He really does care. Perhaps it's a reflection like he suggested to you in the documentary extract that you've, you've just watched. Uh, he didn't want to reveal what he was really thinking and feeling because he didn't feel that he'd get the support from his colleagues that he should have done. So he internalised it all. And in this poem, this is Simon Armitage giving this soldier a voice to actually say what he is truly thinking and feeling. That's why it really helps that it's written in first-person narrative too. We're getting a real sense of the soldier's voice in this. I also like the use of um, B words and D words. Um, so I want you to really look at this poem and say it aloud to yourself as well to get a sense of what do the sounds of those particular letters imply about the soldier's thoughts, the soldier's feelings, the soldier's emotions. How is Simon, Simon Armitage really exploiting the sound of words there to try and convey that emotion across to his readers? Context you already know about, but it's definitely worth considering, you know, what is the impact knowing that this is a real life soldier's experience and not just something completely made up? Have a go yourself at just making your own notes about particular things you've noticed that are, you think are important, that are significant about the form, that you think are significant and important about structure and language, and particularly that bit about context. So you can pause this video, this slideshow at any point and start to write some thoughts down as we go. It's such a fascinating documentary, this. I would recommend that you actually watch the whole thing. Um, and it is available on YouTube. Certainly is at the time of me making this PowerPoint presentation for you anyway. Um, although it can be quite harrowing, quite upsetting. But I couldn't let it go without showing you um, this other poem um, that was also inspired by interviews that Simon Armitage conducted whilst being involved in this Channel 4 documentary, They're Not Dead. Instead of looking at the perspective of the soldier, like he did with Remains, this time he took the perspective of the wife of the soldier. And this is interesting because it starts to explore then how military conflict, or indeed any sort of conflict, but in this case, military conflict has as much of an impact on the family and friends of the soldiers concerned um, as it does the soldiers. They may not themselves have been physically harmed, but certainly emotionally and mentally, um, the scarring is very deep. And sometimes, um, you know, actually never to be solved. Um, this poem then isn't actually part of your power and conflict cluster, but it is such a lovely poem um, and it's obviously directly related to remains um, that I wanted to share it with you. OK, it's called The Manhunt um, and the subtitle of the poem is, is Laura's poem, the title, um, because he wanted it to be clear that this was from the wife's point of view. After the first phase, after passionate nights and intimate days, only then would he let me trace the frozen river which ran through his face. Only then would he let me explore the blown hinge of his lower jaw and handle and hold the damaged porcelain collarbone and mind and attend the fractured rudder of shoulder blade and finger and thumb, the parachute silk of his punctured lung. Only then could I bind the struts and climb the rungs of his broken ribs and feel the hurt of his grazed heart. 
skirting along, only then could I picture the scan, the foetus of metal beneath his chest, where the bullet had finally come to rest. Then I widened the search, traced the scarring back to its source, to a sweating, unexploded mine buried deep in his mind around which every nerve in his body had tightened and closed. Then, and only then, did I come close. Now, what this kind of reminds me of is, um, again, it's, it's, it's kind of chronological. Um, the soldiers returned after being patched up and repaired physically, if you like, in a hospital. Um, but the scarring remains, the physical scarring, and also definitely the mental scarring. So at first, the wife, I can imagine they're, they're perhaps, you know, just sat on the sofa or maybe even lying down in bed. And maybe he's asleep and she can't sleep and she's looking at her husband. And she's following the scarring on his body and trying to empathize, trying to put herself in his position and she realizes that she just can't and the enjambment here in this poem just like with remains is is really effective that listing of all the different physical injuries that this her husband this soldier has sustained in this particular attack it feels never-ending there's so much going on and then it hasn't ended because only in the, the last five stanzas does she start to then consider, in fact, even the last three stanzas, she starts to consider where is the real injury? And this is actually in his mind. And just like with remains, we've got a sense of that, the effect of that post-traumatic stress disorder, haven't we? Um, where these guys will never completely get over their experiences and the impact that that has on the families feeling so helpless um loving these people wanting to make things better for them and knowing that you cannot no matter what you try and do you cannot possibly empathize with them completely you can only ever come close and that's exactly what Laura's poem is about the title itself is interesting, The Manhunt. You know, she's, she's searching for that man that she married, maybe who's been lost forever. She's searching for that man who's experienced this awful trauma um, and is trying to find him and bring him back to himself. But, you know, that hunt is, is not over, not by a long chalk. I'd like you now then to, to think about, you know, making connections between these two poems. They've both been written by Simon Armitage and, and both have very similar contexts, um, but both written from different perspectives. Um, there are many similarities between them. They're both written after the event and they both deal with this concept of post-traumatic stress disorder. But Remains is from the soldier's perspective, the manhunt is from the soldier's wife's perspective. And that is an interesting and deliberate choice that the writer has made. But what's the impact of it? Have a go at answering that question about the connections that can be made. Because again, this is good practice for your exam, not only in the um, cluster question, but also in your unseen poetry question. You are expected to be able to make connections between two poems. Okay, time to recap. So we've been focusing on the poem Remains by Simon Armitage and we have looked at the writer's craft and I've just put for you a few things there that I think are personally for me anyway, specifically significant in terms of the choices that he's made when putting this poem together. I just want to read it through for you myself uh, so that you can 
get a sense of where I'm hearing some of these sounds that I refer to in the language section and where the breaks are really evident and really effective in terms of the use of enjambment there. Remains by Simon Armitage. On another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank, and one of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind, so all three of us open fire. Three of a kind all let him fly, and I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times, and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street, and out on patrol I walk over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave, but I blink, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep, and he's probably armed and possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds, and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land, or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Those breaks for the enjambment, as I've put on the slide there, I can really hear him, I can actually see him, it's almost like he's, he's acting it out for me, um, telling this story to me in my mind's eye. And that's why watching the documentary was so useful, first of all, because that reinforces this idea, because we know Simon Armitage actually met this guy, listened to him, as virtually picked phrases, words that the guy actually used in the interview in that documentary on Channel 4, and put them directly into the poem. And you can see him kind of coming in and out of this story and at some points he's telling this story as if it's almost happening to somebody else and it's just well, whatever it's just one of those things but then that enjambment makes him stop and makes you stop and makes you realize this is no odd event this is no one event that he's just going to get over this is going to be something that stays with him for the rest of his life and he's going to really struggle um, you get that real sense of struggle I think towards the end of the poem particularly when as I've said in that third bullet point under form when it breaks down and that seemingly regimented ordered four line stanza construction that we'd had in the form before is no longer there once you get to stanza eight The language for me as well, that repetition of probably on, possibly not, it only happens twice, but it's one of those things that kind of sticks with you. And why? Because that is the sum up of the problem that this guy is actually going through. He doesn't know whether the looter was armed or not. If he was armed, great. We were justified in the decision that we took to shoot him because we were working in the best interests of the many and not the few. But if he wasn't armed, we've taken an innocent man's life. And that is what he can't cope with. And it's made worse because he's never going to know the answer. The B and the D sounds, particularly towards the latter half of that poem, blood shadow, but, blink, burst, bank, dream, dozen, drink, drugs, dug, dead. Okay, they're all really plosive sounds. All that means is that they, you kind of almost spit them out. 
So whenever we get angry at something, our language gets very stilted. Um, and, you know, we, we like these kind of strong sounding letters that we can kind of spit out because it, it's enacting, if you like, our emotion. It's bringing it out of ourselves. But likewise, that repeat of that S, and it's not easy to say that. You have a go at it yourself. Sun stunned, sand smothered land, or six feet under in desert sand. These S sounds just, they all go on and on and on. You know, it's just a shh, almost like that kind of white noise um, when something's not tuned in properly or when there's interference on something. And I think that's marvellous at, at trying to recreate for us some idea of what it must be like to have thoughts like this in your head that you can never get get rid of they are incessant they're never ending you've constantly got this in your mind i hope this has been helpful to you um and that you'll look at it many times and listen to it many times um thank you for listening bye bye